everybody. Welcome to our session on uh, agent-based models of social networks. Yesterday, there uh, has already been uh, such a session. Uh, today, we have a second one and tomorrow there will be a third one. Um, and the main theme of these sessions is integrating agents' decision-making to network dynamics. Um, jointly, uh, this set of sessions is chaired by uh, Philip Achnesens from the New University of Trento, Federico Bianchi um, from the University of Milan, myself, Andreas Flache from the University of Groningen, and Karoi Takac from the Linköping University in Sweden. Uh, this particular session today will be chaired by myself and uh, Federico. We are very happy to have an uh, invited speaker, Christoph Stadtfeld from the ETH Zurich, who will be the first speaker in our program. Um, I'm not sure, Federico, according to the schedule, do people expect uh, Christoph to start at 14.05? Yeah, I mean, we, we, the idea was to keep it quite flexible so that we had a few minutes to, to introduce. So feel free to take a few minutes more, Andreas, mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure that people will not come in at 14 or 5 expecting Christoph to start then and be disappointed if he is already starting uh, his uh, presentation. Well, actually, according to the schedule, Christoph is supposed to, 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 to have already started now. So, so then uh, I only say that after Christoph's uh, presentation, we will have a number of further presentations, one by uh, Karoy uh, on social network dynamics and sustained grading discriminations, a further one by Jonas Stein from the University of Groningen on homophily in social networks and the propagation of false information, and then a third one by Alec McGale from Cornell University on how extraversion structures friendship networks. Um, we open with uh, the presentation by Christoph Stadtfeld, who is uh, a very important scholar in the field of developing models uh, uh, of networks on the one hand on the statistical side. So how do we connect network data to statistical models of networks? as well as uh, linking this to uh, simulation models, which is, of course, from the point of view of our session, a very interesting uh, combination. Um, so we are very much looking forward to your uh, presentation, uh, Christoph. Um, please ask questions in the chat, uh, which will be monitored uh, by Federico. Well, thanks Andreas, for this uh, very nice introduction. And uh, thanks also Philip, Federico, Karoy for for the introduction, uh, for the invitation to this uh, to this workshop, it's pretty exciting, and I'm looking forward to the to the day today and tomorrow. Um, can you all see my screen? Perfect. So I'm going to talk about network mechanisms and network models, and this is based on joint work with uh, Viviana Amati, also from the the Social Networks Lab here at ETH Zurich, and and other people. Um, just to start very broadly, networks come in many forms. I mean, you can collect network data, for example, like these data that were collected by Karoy um, through surveys in a school class, trying to figure out how school kids, how students are friends or perceive others as friends of themselves and how they perceive others as someone they dislike. So these are these red and blue ties in this network. And it's, a, it's an interesting network because obviously there's something individual going on in the sense of, uh, of agents' decision in the spirit of the session that individuals think about who they like and who they don't like, but also there's something going on on the group level. So there, there might be groups that are actually emerging within which it's more likely that people like each other and between groups that people might dislike one another. Um, this is a famous network data set collected by Peter Behrman and others, which is based on, on interviews. And this is a network of sexual contacts between high school students and where well, the data were collected differently. And also the network is somewhat different because this is the outcome of a kind of a matching process. People have preferences, but they have to find a partner that, that agrees on forming a tie in order to, to establish a, a romantic or sexual relationship. 
But again, the network structure matters in how these ties are being formed. If you're, in a, if you're far away from someone, if you're on two different ends of the network, it might be less likely that you meet in the first place and form a tie. And uh, also processes on this network might actually be important if you think about spread of STDs or, or uh, information in, in, in networks like this. Um, this is again a different example. So this is a purely artificial network. This is not empirical data, but it's an, an agent-based simulation, which just assumes that people connect to others with certain preferences. They want to be embedded in groups. They want to be um, have reciprocal ties, ties that are not too long in a sense, but at the same time, they want to be also connected to people who are similar to them, but they also tend to become similar to the people they are connected to. And uh, over time, um, you will see that uh, that this simulation leads to a, a network that is uh, somewhat segregated in terms of, in this case, you can think of this as opinions. So you have clusters of yellow people, clusters of red people. And again, something happened to the network based on these individual decisions that matters for how people can behave in the future, because it's pretty difficult to be a green node in this cluster on the lower left, even if you, if you well, if you can, can achieve all your preferences by connecting to others who are close by, you still have difficulties uh, connecting to others who are similar to you. So you might be more likely to become red as well. Um, and these two sides of, of network models or social systems in general is something that, that uh, are, a, are a central motive in, in sociology so that you have something that is going on on the macro level. Um, so you, for example, have a network in which you observe segregation, group formation, distances, and those, those network features, they affect how individuals can actually express their preferences about tie formation. Um, so on an indi individual level, people have preferences, they form ties, or maybe they change their individual opinions or other individual outcomes based on the network that they're embedded in, and jointly this creates the network that in turn affects individuals on the, on the micro level. And so the first claim of this talk would be that social networks in general are a very nice framework to express these micro macro processes in, in complex social systems because they have a language for, for well, there's a mathematical language that allows us to describe systems on the network level and also on the micro level. But um, at the same time, we can, we can theorize on, on both levels and we can, we can create models that operate on both levels. Um, and for example, if we think about the first idea, why are individuals affected by their network position? We can, we can look into a lot of literature that tells us that, for example, the, the position that individuals find themselves in within a network, and this network can have features like being segregated, being having long and short distances, that determines their access to support, their level of well-being, different health outcomes, competitive advantage, social influence, all these are processes that are how that describe how an individual is affected by its network positions and also by the structure of the network as a whole. And we can use the, the language of social networks to formalize um, those by, for example, determining what's the what's the, the density of one's network, how embedded is a person What's the level of brokerage homogeneity? And if you just think about social influence, for example, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to have access to new ideas if you are in a network that is highly homogenous and highly embedded, but you might be better off being in a broker position. So this is something how the network structure and ties you don't control yourself can affect individual outcomes. But the part I want to focus more on in this talk is this idea of why do individual, individuals form social ties? And we can, we can start with, with the general theories and the motivations that people strive for. So for example, they strive for safety, for effectiveness, for cognitive balance, they strive for social capital, they wanna build a social identity. And all these ideas explain why people might be more likely to create certain ties than others. If you think about, um, agents' decision-making, agents will be more likely to create those ties that increase some kind of utility that relates to some of these categories of, uh, of 
goals that individuals want to achieve within networks. And at the same time, there's some, some limitation due to costs and cognitive constraints. People can't just be connected to everyone, which might be the perfect strategy in terms of social capital, but there's always some, some cost associated on different levels with having ties. So we can, we can formalize these as kind of utility function, if you, if you will, um, and try to understand what are the theoretical causal explanations that make people create ties. And uh, well, we can think of causal explanations that relate to those categories up here, and we can somehow map them to formal and formalizable network mechanisms like reciprocity, transitivity, popularity, homophily. And I want to take a closer look at these processes down here, because sometimes in the networks literature, we talk about these processes as mechanisms. And at the same time, we, we talk in sociology or in analytical sociology about the idea of, uh, of social mechanisms. And I want to try to carve out a little bit how they are similar and how they are different and how we can use one to approach the other. So in this, uh, in this chapter with Viviana, we are looking into this idea of network mechanisms and first of all, define that network mechanisms as classes of multiple social networks that occur in the same structural positions. And you see here a figure inspired by, by the work, by the, well, the seminal essay of, of Hedstrom and Swedberg. So there's an input of the mechanism and an output, and we explain the presence of a tie with the structural position of the two individuals that, uh, that are connected by this tie that is to be explained. And this position that they're in is what we call the structural position. And we can think of this as something like the local environment that sender and the receiver of the tie are embedded in, and that can relate to network ties, to individual attributes, to, to relational attributes in the network. So this is some kind of a, a function that maps or that measures a position based on a number of attributes in the local environments of sender and receiver. And two simple examples would be of a structural position. The two nodes have the same attribute, or that two nodes may be indirectly tied through a third node. And this structural position may affect the likelihood, the probability of a tie between those two individuals. What is important here that that this does not yet determine like a causal explanation, but that multiple causal explanations can actually link a structural position to the presence of a tie. Um, in the social networks literature, we typically start when we think about statistical models about generic network, uh, some generic network mechanisms. So there are certain parameters that you find in many statistical models. So for example, density, reciprocity, transitivity, popularity, activity, attraction, homophily. Let's say these are the the, the most prominent seven, seven mechanisms that we find in the modeling literature. And uh, each one of those captures multiple causal explanations for why a tie may be present. And these are quite important when we do model fitting from a statistical perspective, because these are important baseline mechanisms that ex, uh, explain the presence of tie in social networks. But because they are these bigger classes, we may sometimes actually want to refine them in our modeling to approach or get closer to actual causal explanations. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about is also how we can, besides refining them, um, interpreting them in multi-mechanistic network models. So just to give three examples of, of those mechanisms here, I mean, one of the most famous network mechanisms is, is transitivity and the structural position in this case is just determined by the sender and the receiver of the explained tie. The senders on the left, the receivers on the right, they're indirectly connected through a third node. But this itself does not establish a causal explanation because it could be that being indirectly tied through a third node makes, makes a tie more likely because there's as some existing spatial and social distances in the network that already both explain this two path between sender and receiver and their direct connection. There could also be like a three-way similarity attraction explanation. So these three nodes have similar attributes and all have a preference for connecting to similar attributes, which also explains why this tie is more likely 
in, in such homophilous structures, in such structures where all nodes have similar attributes. Another explanation, and there are many more, is, is Heide's balance theory or structural balance theory that suggests that actors who are not tied to someone they're indirectly tied to may, under certain circumstances, perceive stress, perceive this as stressful, and thereby will be more likely to connect to this person. So this is a cognitive process, a causal explanation for why we might observe these disclosure. And what is important, and I think it's mostly done carefully in the networks, network modeling literature, is that, that we cannot directly interpret one of those mechanisms as, it's, as one of those causal paths. Um, homophily, here the structural position is that the sender and the receiver of the explained tie share a novel attribute. Again, multiple explanation. There could be cognitive processes about similarity attraction, but there could also be just structural processes going on that, for example, ties are affected by some kind of baseline segregation, like macro level features of the network or social distances in the network that just explain why ties of those who are in shorter distance are more likely. And as a third example, I want to pick like the, a bit of a curious case of those network mechanisms, which is density, because here the structural position is actually empty, because this is a, a mechanism that does not consider any information taken from the network or from attributes, but, uh, but it's just the, the general tendency of tie being created. And again, here we can have multiple causal explanations why those might differ in different networks or between different people. There could be social desirability biases, there could be contextual factors, there could be individual psychological traits, something like extroversion explaining individual differences in, in the tendency of creating ties. So again, this is not a, it's not a causal explanation and it's kind of obvious in this example of, the, of this very basic um, network mechanism. Um, well, of course, this is not, not very, very satisfying if we have these mechanisms that seem to be important in network modeling, but we can't really interpret them in a, in a well, close to some causal explanation because there are so many things going on at the same time. And one approach that we can take is actually refining those network mechanisms and specify them in some more detail so that they are closer to the exact um, um, causal explanation that we, are, that we are interested in. So for example, if we were interested in testing like a HIDA mechanism about uh, social triadic closure based on stress-induced um, well, stress-induced triadic closure, um, we could formulate network mechanisms where the structural position, for example, considers whether individuals who have been at some point in a social situation with uh, a friend and a friend of their friend that they are at this point not, not uh, in a positive relationship with, whether they have perceived stress in that situation and whether this will at a later point in time explain the creation or the, the development of a perception of friendship between those two people. And this would be an explanation that is actually then very close to the, to the theoretical argument made by, made by Heide. Um, so there might still be multiple causal explanations that are covered, even if we have a very specific mechanism like this. However, it already rules out a number of alternative explanations because it's more specific than these general network mechanisms that I've talked about earlier. What is, however, important to consider is that uh, if we want to have more specific network mechanisms, we also need to have data collection strategies and models that are able to incorporate these necessary additional situational measurements. And another concern that, that is important to keep in mind is that the more detailed our models get, the more fine-grained mechanisms we add to our models, the more we increase model complexity and we might run into, into very practical challenges like uh, statistical power of, uh, of our empirical setting and model. Another approach we can take to, to understand in more detail what is actually the, the causal explanation underlying a network mechanism is that we have models that consider many of those mechanisms at the same time. So multi-mechanistic network models. And basically all big network models are models of that kind. So for example, 
exponential random graph models, stochastic actor-oriented models that Christian talked about yesterday, or relation event models such as Dynams. These are all models that allow you to incorporate many different network mechanisms and test their residual effect. And this is important because if you, for example, find evidence for a transitivity mechanism in, in an empirical study, while testing for a homophily mechanism on a specific attribute, you can already conclude that the residual effect of transitivity is not only explained by the fact that there is, a, that there is homophily on this attribute going on, but that, there, that it must be one of the other explanations, or it's likely to be one of the other explanation, explanations why we observe triadic closure. So for example, structural balance, social distances, similarity on a different attribute. So still of th many things to consider, but by testing multiple mechanisms in one framework, we can get a better understanding of, uh, of uh, their relative interpretation. So to, to go back to what I said earlier, so how are network mechanisms then related to this, to social mechanisms as, as uh, discussed or introduced by Hedstrom and Swedberg in, in the 1998 essay and, and an earlier book chapter, I think. Um, so first of all, it's important to note that the single network mechanism is typically not sufficiently specific to be considered a social mechanism in the spirit of analytical sociology. It does have a very clearly defined input and output. So we have these structural positions and we have the observations of network ties as input and output. We, can, we, can, we have network data, we have network concepts that allow us to formalize how those two are linked. However, they are often not specific to one causal explanation. But if we can test multiple of those mechanisms in one network model or are able to develop network mechanism, mechanisms that are more specific to, to one causal explanation, like in the example of, uh, of stress and situational stress um, in, with regards to Heider's balance theory, then we can actually get closer to causal explanations, build models that get increasingly detailed to try to understand what is actually the, 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 the reason why we observe certain ties being created and others not. And then we can actually approach this idea of social mechanisms in, in the spirit of, of Hedstrom and Swedberg. So I will give, uh, give two examples from this uh, paper with Viviana in which, uh, in which we use data from the Swiss student life study. So this is a study we conducted over the past few years here, uh, well, um, here in Switzerland. And the background is that we followed a co or multiple cohorts of first year undergraduate students over, over the course of their bachelor's program to understand how social integration emerges between students who were basically or rarely acquainted to one another beforehand and how those levels of social integration affect the students, their students' well-being, motivation and academic success. And here on the right, you see one snapshot of one subset one sub cohort of the network in which uh, students are tied through friendship relationships that are these solid lines, but also through advice relationships. So providing support to one another, which are these dashed lines. They also have different genders, different study programs, which is indicated by, by shapes and colors, uh, by shapes and colors here, exactly. So what, what we did with, within the student life study, and this is one thing that will come up in a bit, is that we do not only collect uh, network data with surveys, but also through social sensor data, uh, social sensor experiments, social media data we collected. We did short surveys where we asked shorter questions on the smartphones in between longer surveys, and we did some network experiments. And overall, we have about close to 1,000 students who participated at least once in the study. So and I don't want to dig into a specific model. I just want to give an example how within this empirical setting we can, we can test network mechanisms and interpret network mechanisms. So this, for example, is, a, is an example result using a stochastic actor oriented model like the ones that Christian discussed yesterday in his talk. Um, the explained tie is, is in this case uh, friendship perceptions collected through surveys and the statistical model well, is, is the sum. 
And the, ex the example mechanisms that I look at is transitivity. So the tendency to connect to those you are indirectly tied to through a third person. And we do find significant uh, evidence for this, uh, for this mechanism. And however, there's still multiple causal explanations. This could be clustering along some unobserved attributes. However, not the ones that we are explicitly testing for, which are gender and study program. There could be group formation broker, uh, processes. There could be cognitive balance arguments. Um, but we also know it's not a residual effect of popularity. So the tendency to connect to those people who are very central in the network. So we have already ruled out um, or controlled for a number of alternative classes of explanations, which already gives us a bit more of a detailed picture about what this transitivity parameter actually means. However, there are still a number of, of explanations left um, why, why we observe transitivity in this network. Um, sometimes we have data that are more fine-grained and of a different kind in this case, um, where we can test hypotheses that are then more specific or me mechanisms that are more specific to, to some in, in some aspects. So what, what we're looking here at is, is data we collected in, as part of a um, social sensor experiment where people were wearing RFID badges that just report when people stand face to face to one another, how long this happened, who they turned to afterwards. So the explained tie is here, who interacts with whom within this specific uh, setting at the beginning of their study. And as a statistical model, we have a dynamic network actor model as we described in the the paper with, uh, with James and Pierre in 2017. Um, so the e example mechanism that I wanna look into is, is this one down here. So it's the, the tendency of individuals to interact with those who have interacted with many within the past 10 minutes. So this is like a popularity network mechanism. However, it's, it's already a bit more specific because we only consider popularity within a shorter time window. What we see is that the residual popularity is actually a negative effect. So there's not at all a tendency to, towards centralized communication. So it's rather a more balanced communication network that we're observing. Um, however, within shorter time windows, we do find um, a positive popularity effect. So, and even though this is more specific and maybe already some, some uh, starting point for, for some interpretation. There are many causal explanations that can play a role here. So there could be short-term Matthew effects that people just observe who's, who, is, uh, who is popular and then they just follow others in, in, in talking to those people. But it might also be just something related to changes in social activity of individuals, some spatial constraints, social mobi uh, spatial mobility. All these things could, uh, could matter and explain and be the one part of the causal explanation why we observe this, this mechanism here. Um, well, these were examples, but then I want to give uh, very briefly talk about another example where we actually use simulations in the framework of, of uh, network mechanisms. And I thought this is very appropriate because this week is about, uh, about simulations and uh, Obviously, we can think of network mechanisms not as just something that we estimate from empirical data, but also something that we specify where we translate a causal explanation into a, a network mechanism, a structural position and an, and an outcome um, to, to try to understand emerging properties of social networks uh, um, through, th through simulations. And this is what we, what we do in a, in a recent paper with, with Karoy and uh, Andras Wörös that we publish in social networks. And here we ask the question, which network mechanisms can help us explain the formation of groups in social networks? And as network mechanisms, we consider different classes. So those mechanisms that explain how people are more likely to, be, to get connected to those they are already in a group with. So what explains how people, how there's uh, increasing group cohesion, and at the same time, mechanisms that explain why people will be less likely to connect to others, thereby explaining the emergence of group boundaries. And if we want to understand how groups emerge in social networks, we actually have to understand both how there is increasing cohesion within groups, but also how do group boundaries come about. And uh, 
Well, I, I don't want to talk about this study in, in detail, but I want to just briefly illustrate the four steps how we, how we use network mechanisms, empirical models and simulation models to kind of uh, approach this question of which network mechanisms explain the formation of groups. And uh, so there are four columns on this slide. And at the beginning, we think about what are actually the theoretical expectations. So what is our theoretical models and which network mechanisms can we use to represent this theoretical causal model that we start off from. And we have a, a number of mechanisms that, that explain how, how positive ties come about. So for example, reciprocity, transitivity, homophily down here. But at the same time, we consider also how negative ties come about or how, well, how to explain the, the lack of positive ties between people. And also here we think of mechanisms like popularity effects, uh, um, um, reciprocity, or some kind of a mixed effects where we consider whether people are more likely to dislike those who are enemies of their friends, for example. And then we, we have empirical data collected by Karoy, and then we estimate models. And we learn, for example, and this is the this is the first step. We learned, for example, that there is evidence for transitivity in net network mechanisms, for popularity, for homophily, but also for certain mixed effects that consider both positive and negative ties, like being friends with enemies of your enemies, for example. And then we ask the question, okay, in how far is a model able to, to explain the emergence and stability of groups when it only considers these positive forces of attraction versus a model that considers both positive forces and forces of repulsion. So those that explain why you would not create positive ties to some people and rather a negative tie. So and then we can use exactly the same network mechanisms. In this case, in this case, even the parameter that we got from empirical data to do simulation studies to learn if we have a good expectation about um, individual behavior on in the agents' decision-making in networks, how does that translate into, into network level features on the macro level? And uh, here you see, for example, that the models uh, substantively differ in terms of the number of in-group ties that they explain. So the red part is the, the model that cons cons um, considers also these repulsive forces, whereas the blue one is the one that only considers force of attraction. And there's also a pretty significant gap in terms of how stable those groups are over time. And there's a lengthy discussion on how we can and cannot interpret those, those findings, how reasonable this model is, where there are, whether there are statistic limitations, whether there are limitations in terms of, of model degeneracy. Um, but the, the general idea of using network mechanisms as a central part, both for statistical models and for simulation models, and at best, like it has been proposed by many people over the last years, combine them within one empirical setting. This is something that we try to illustrate in this, in this recent paper. Okay, with this, I would like to, I'm sorry jump one slide too far and now my computer is stuck with this. Um, with this, I would like to conclude. Thanks for attending. The, the main claims of this talk, I've just listed once more on this slide, but I think I would stop at this point and uh, I'm happy for any suggestions, questions and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, for this uh, very inspiring presentation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure people have comments uh, and questions. Um, I'm not sh I don't see anything in the chat, but that may be due to me. Um, so uh, I propose that people also can just unmute uh, their microphones and uh, raise questions and Federico will tell us whether there's anything in the chat. So, uh -huh. here's someone coming. Uh, in case someone is at this moment asking a question, you should unmute your microphone.
I don't hear one. Okay, Christoph, then let me start. Um, I, I really like this, uh, this approach very much. Um, you were, uh, let's say, uh, at various uh, uh, points in your presentation, you were discussing the relationship between network mechanisms as you presented them to us, for example, this reciprocity, homophily, transitivity, uh, and so on, processes, um, and causal underlying processes. Like, well, you could uh, want to have reciprocal ties because you want to maximize your status in a person, uh, a high status person has approached you. So you want to make sure you approach this high status person back to really keep this person as a friend and that maximizes or increases your status. Um, so yeah, my, my, my question or actually more my uh, my my wish for you to to comment on on this and and reflect a bit on on this for us um, is uh, how do you see the relation between these say deeper underlying if you want behavioral processes and the network mechanisms which in different contexts may be the may may in different ways be related to such underlying causal processes so in some contexts the same causal behavior process may lead to reciprocity, in another it may lead to transitivity, in the third one it may lead to homophily, for example. Um, I'm just wondering uh, yeah, uh, about your view uh, on, on this and what we might need to do with, the, uh, with this in, in modeling work. Um, well, thanks, thanks, Andreas. So, I mean, our, our what, what we are interested in and what we are after, of course, is always causal, but we also know that we can't test causal explanations directly in, in empirical settings. So for example, to, to follow up on your example, if, if you, your expectation is that uh, individuals will be more likely to, uh, let's say, form ties to higher status peers because they, they hope to, uh, to to increase their own status. And let's say due to the composition of, of status levels, there's also a lot of uh, on the same status level ties, which then um, explain reciprocity, then your explanation is actually, or what you're interested in is whether people are likely to create ties to those high in status. And, and of course you could aim for developing a network mechanism that measures exactly that, um, whether, for example, if you have a reasonable operationalization of status or measurement of status, then your theory would, would suggest that, that people will be more likely to create ties to, to a person with a high status the way you, you, can, you can measure this. And of course, you can test this directly as a network mechanism where the structural position is just whether, whether the receiver of, of the tie has a high value in this specific, uh, with regards to the specific status measure. Um, and this would be a prediction which is in line with your, with your theoretical expectations. But of course, in, it doesn't in turn mean that if you find then a positive effect for this very specific network mechanism, is that the, the theoret well, the causal path is exactly the way you, you, you explained it, um, or you, you thought about it. I mean, it could still be, if you find evidence that people are more likely to connect to high status peers, it could still be that the, that the causal explanation is that, uh, in fact, they're interested in connecting to those who are good looking and good looking is just uh, correlated with, with high status. So there could always be an alternative explanation that however, you can also integrate in your model just to kind of narrow down the, the set of possible explanations. I mean, like we do it in any, empirical analyses and any statistical models. It's just important to, to be aware that the, and I think this is sometimes a bit, bit hand wavy in the literature that these network mechanisms are not specific enough to, uh, to be directly linked to one causal explanations, but that they're more like, a, like a groups or sets of possible explanations that are reflected by this network mechanism. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So please go ahead if anyone would like to ask something. 
Federico um, yeah. says he would have a question if no one from the audience has one. Can I ask a question about the calibration of the network? Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, so I'm from University of Sheffield, and uh, we're building, um, we're using uh, Hestrom as well. Uh, so we um, uh, building an alcohol use models, and in these models, um, we want to incorporate a social network. So um, the way we approach it right now is that we just um, uh, put in the mechanism, the, the, what this mechanism that you say, and then we, we calibrate it and we say, okay, look like uh, the networks. Uh, let's say we calibrate it to the R degree. So average, you have three friends. Um, and these characteristics also, we want to, um, this social network uh, mechanism, we want to include the drinking behavior as one of their decision making when, they, when they're making friends as well. Um, so what happened is that now, let's say we introduce more uh, more mechanisms into the models and then the agent drinkings, let's say based on norms on their own, blah, blah, blah. And then over time, um, and now we just run it over time. So we calibrate the model. We can, we can easily calibrate it to the drinking um, um, behavior of the agents, how many drinks that they have in general. But now like, is it possible to, um, to track whether the network is still plausible? Let's say if over, we call, because we calibrate over a period of time of 30, 40 years, and uh, we are not sure uh, what, what characteristic of a network we should looking at. Is it, we, is it like we keep tracking the number of friends so that they come, they're like from three friends, they don't become like a hundred friends. Yeah, or should we tracking other characteristic of the network? Okay, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, and you're making a good point here because uh, what is uh, indeed a bit of a, of a challenge in particular with uh, if you have very simple types of simulation models where you do make some assumptions and uh, um, well have a, a very small set of processes or network mechanisms that you consider is that uh, indeed you might end up with generating networks that are maybe not realistic. And then of course the question is how, how far is the, the simulation itself valid? And I think uh, one of the discussions in the, in the paper with, with Kara and Ondros that I briefly mentioned earlier is how difficult it actually is to, to, to map multiple mechanisms to a model that is still reasonable in terms of what it generates. And you said, simulating forward for 30, 40 years. And of course, it's very difficult to consider all these subtle processes that will matter and explain how networks change over 30, 40 years. And even if you just think about modeling change of networks over, over a month or two, this is already, is already often a challenge to do this in a way that you don't uh, end up with, uh, with outcomes that are too, too stylized to be... Um, to be considered realistic uh, representations of networks. Mm. So should we approach it like, because like in our models, we're expecting to, to do this, you know, like a long run calibration, uh, the long run simulation over 30, 40 years. So how about like, if, can we approach it in a way, say we calibrate the network um, outside of the simulation, let's say every 10 years, we recalibrate it and then input the network in. Like, so basically during the simulation run that the network stays the same and every 10 years you make some significant change say everyone this is a new connection yeah uh, i'm very yeah. sorry but we have very little time to for the answer so please be quick christoph yeah yes yeah. um yeah i i agree so i think the more information you can use to calibrate your model or re-estimate parameters from your from real data the, the higher are the chances that your model will actually be meaningful yeah all right thank you Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you can't hear us clapping, but if it would be possible, then certainly you would hear a lot of clapping hands now. Thanks Thank a lot. So, so uh, we go uh, further to the next presentation, which is by Karoi Takac. Uh, Karoi, are you ready? And can you share your screen then? So uh, in the meantime, I can briefly introduce uh, Karo. He's a, a professor at the Linköping University uh, in Sweden, and he is uh, one of the few people who combine simulation modeling uh, of uh, uh, 
social networks with empirical research, uh, particularly also on adolescent social networks. So again, a very nice combination. Kawai, we are looking forward. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope uh, the screen is uh, visible. So this is a joint work with the daughter Takish Falushi, who is also in the audience. And uh, we, we start with the problem that uh, certain disadvantaged groups uh, in a society uh, have, uh, for instance, lower wages, lower grades. Uh, and this is also the case even if you control for the abilities they have on average. So this is uh, after after you consider that, that, that uh, so for instance, you consider two individuals with the same abilities, then there is still a, a difference in the, in the wage or in the grade that you receive in, the, in school. So there, of course, there are a lot of sociological explanations that can explain this difference that is beyond the, the difference in abilities on average. So, uh, um, and some of these uh, uh, explanations concentrate on, on a social background. It's also a cumulative disadvantage that, that for instance, you have from, from, your, from your home, home environment. So, for instance, you have uh, different access to, to read, reading books and to, to have different linguistic capacities. And uh, there is also, there might be different societal ex expectations. And there, in the school, for instance, there also could be a difference how uh, teachers um, perceive the, the achievement of, of, of different uh, uh, individuals. So uh, depending on the group membership. So um, there is also uh, uh, indication that, uh, uh, um, that there might be differences with regard to uh, uh, how um, 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 the teachers evaluate the behavior or the classroom behavior of, of, uh, of uh, students. So uh, in this case, for instance, it might be the case that due to the, the, the different behavior patterns uh, or dif different classroom activities, uh, so, uh, the uh, disadvantaged groups such as uh, the Roma in case of Hungary uh, are receiving uh, worse grades on average than, than the, the majority students who are Hungarians. And that also could be the case that the majority of the teachers are from the, major, uh, uh, from the majority group who uh, uh, also more likely to give better grades for, for members of the, the majority group. So of course there might be this kind of explanations, but, but, but the, uh, for us it's more interesting to look at those explanations that are uh, 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 endogenous in a, in a sense that it's, of course, the teacher decides about the grades, but, but also the peers. This, uh, uh, in this case, the school kids might have an impact on, on, uh, on the efforts that you make in school. So, and efforts also determine uh, largely, of course, in our view, uh, uh, the, the grades. So uh, efforts and abilities together are, 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 are in uh, F our impact have an impact on, on achievement and uh, 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 this is uh, uh, in, in this case I, I would say that effort is influenced largely by 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 the peers so our question is actually uh, if social networks make this situation worse uh, or does it help to 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 have a, have an influence from friends so uh, we know from the literature that uh, that uh, uh, relevant peers in school have a large impact on, on, on the, the effort uh, and also might have a large impact on the aspirations, the expected uh, uh, expectations about uh, my ability, how, to what extent it can influence my, my final uh, performance. And uh, uh, we also know from the literature that, social, that uh, schools, uh, uh, although even if they are uh, desegregated and in, uh, integrate also uh, members of minority groups and majority groups, they are still the uh, social, social networks are largely segregated. So the, this also means that if, if relevant peers are from the same group, it, uh, it could also be that uh, 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 that they impact your performance in a way to uh, 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 move away from from the members of the uh, from the uh, the performance of the member or the effort of the the uh, members of the other group. So there also there is a popular claim actually in the literature of oppositional culture, and also uh, sometimes it is labeled in the American uh, literature as acting white. 
is that those uh, uh, students who are performing very well from the disadvantaged group are put back by their peers uh, uh, and they therefore they are not able to 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 show that kind of performance uh, uh, that is uh, actually uh, according to their their abilities and effort so uh, in this case uh, the claim is that that oppositional cultures evolve in which the members of the disadvantaged group are uh, influencing their peers in order to lower their achievement lower their effort actually so this is the claim that we uh, that would cause that would be uh, uh, interesting to study uh, in a social network study, uh, setting and with, with social network analysis in a longitudinal setting. But uh, most of most of these uh, mechanisms actually are very difficult to 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 test in in our um, in an empirical uh, setting. So therefore, we uh, believe that there is also we would first need to to uh, to clarify if this is a claim. That is logic. That is a fully logical claim uh, by agent-based simulation. So actually, our aim is to combine empirical uh, uh, an empirical calibrated uh, simulation with an idea how to uh, to check the presence of these mechanisms in a sense that that if they are are able to grow those kind of differences that we observe in reality. Uh, so um, and. Uh, when we are talking about network mechanisms that and uh, that how peers are influencing uh, the effort of of uh, students in a school then there might be two different uh, uh, kind of uh, mechanisms the first one is that that uh, is social influence that that uh, peers of uh, from this from the minority group uh, influence the minority group members and peers from the majority group uh, uh, as these networks are largely segregated influence uh, uh, members of the, the, the majority group. The other mechanism is that that also that takes place over time is that uh, is, is selection. So I also if I'm a member of a, of a minority group then I will choose members from the minority group as friends and also if I'm from the majority group I will choose members of the majority group as friends over time which creates kind of a, a, a stronger segregation and also creates the bubbles uh, in which uh, 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 social influence can take place and further increase the differences that, that are there at, at the outset. So, um, and also of course, uh, there is also uh, uh, the uh, acting white mechanism can also take place with regard to network selection in a sense that you exclude those uh, who are performing too well uh, from your circles if, if your achievement or your effort or your norms are not to, not to, to that, those high expectations. So basically these uh, best performers uh, or geeks could be excluded easily from, from uh, networks if, if a selection is based on, on uh, similarity in effort or similarity in, uh, in achievement. Uh, so what we uh, use as a, as a basis of, of, of our model collaboration is a longitudinal survey uh, that is mentioned also by, by Christoph recently and uh, in his presentation it's from Hungary and uh, it contains Hungarians and, and, and uh, Roma minority students. It is a, not a random sample, it contains schools uh, from areas in which the Roma uh, minorities well represented. Uh, uh, and in the sample that we use for, for the analysis there are Quite, quite a large proportion of Roma students. And we also have information of their social networks, also have information of their self-declared ethnicity and the ethnicity that is assessed by the teacher and, and all the peers perceive their ethnicity. We have information about their social status uh, and also about their uh, behavior that is evaluated by the teacher in a case, in a, in a grade, which is a conduct mark. So, what we see in this uh, in this case in this study is that uh, uh, indeed the grades uh, uh, for the Roma minority in these schools, uh, on average, are lower even if you control for their blind test score results, uh, and even this difference actually is uh, even there if you if you control for social social economic status if you control for for, for certain effects uh, that are related to the teacher uh, student behavior student relationship and also other factors so basically the uh, what we find 
is that that uh, of course some some of these differences explain away by socioeconomic status and some of these differences explained away by by classroom behavior but even if you control for these factors uh, there is still a, net, a significant ethnic difference so basically you could you could either say that this is a clear uh, discrimination but but uh, but we are not certain about that because we also think that that uh, these social network mechanisms that i described before are uh, playing a very important role uh, in how the uh, uh, individual efforts effort levels are are are, are, are chosen by by the students so uh, um, and we are checking if actually if, if these network uh, uh, um, mechanisms are responsible for maintaining or even enlarging this difference over time in a net logo model uh, in which uh, basically the, the, uh, the uh, students are modeled in a way that, that there are two kind of students. They decide about their effort level, their ability is, is given and they cannot change their ability over time. Uh, but the teacher also can have a various level level of uh, discriminations. Uh, so this uh, uh, um, there could be zero. So there would be so completely fair treatment of uh, of uh, students, but there could also be uh, a bias by the teacher. So uh, how the in the how the agents decide about their their effort is that they take into account their their previous effort. Uh, and if it is too too far away from the uh, the grade, then they they experience discrepancies, so they adjust their effort in the in, in uh, the direction, uh, and they also influenced by their peers. Of course, uh, 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 what we have in, in this kind of uh, models then that we build up from scratch is that we can model social influence in very different ways, and we also play around with this uh, a little bit. So we just uh, don't uh, uh, stick to, to an average outer effect that would be typical in this kind of models, but we also play around with different conceptualizations, how can social influence take, uh, take place between peers. And it, uh, it, it, also, includes maybe a uh, it also includes a differential uh, influence, so basically heterogeneity in the, in the effect of influence uh, depending on a group membership of your friends. And also, we also vary if uh, uh, achievement can be observed or only grades can be observed. So the difference is here is actually grades already include the, uh, uh, the discrimination tendency by, by the teacher. And if you just, if you are able to, uh, to observe what achievement, then basically you are able to observe also the effort level of your peers. So there is a difference and we expect also a difference with regard to, to, to the extent uh, 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 how uh, much the, the ethnic gap is maintained over time. So, and uh, for the network level, we also uh, model the network dynamics in a kind of a st standard way that includes uh, reciprocity in the group of police. So basically people are selecting their friends uh, according to known processes and uh, known uh, uh, mechanisms. That also includes actually group-based homophily and also achievement-based homophily or if achievement is not observable, then grade-based homophily. And also, we have uh, 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 also heterogeneity included. If, uh, of course, this could also be uh, excluded in the model. That that uh, 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 in one of the groups that we that is actually informed by by our empirical studies, that one of the groups, the minority group, is more open to uh, uh, to uh, influence than the other one. So, uh, because they also have a different difference on average in the number of, of uh, friendship ties, for instance. So, uh, we can do this in a net, net logo model. And what we observe is basically uh, this is just a screenshot uh, uh, that uh, um, there, we don't see any kind of oppositional culture evolving. So, what, what we observe is there is a huge uh, 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 pressure towards uh, consensus within the group and uh, with regard to the effort level they choose because they of course uh, uh, groups become segregated more and more and more segregated over time given the the mechanisms that we consider and that also means that that there is also a pressure towards consensus with regard to the the choice of effort over time within the group but as the groups are to a certain extent also connected to each other we also see that, that, that these kind of connections that are intergroup connections make it 
make it impossible actually that the effort levels uh, uh, would largely uh, depart from each other in this kind of models that, that don't include only positive social influence. But we also actually see that, the, uh, uh, that, that uh, this kind of dynamics also can create uh, an upward tendency towards large and larger efforts and then, and then sliding it more, more to, the, to, to zero. Uh, so basically that, uh, uh, that you see in this particular example, and that you can also observe that, that the, uh, for one of the groups that is the, the majority group in this case, or, or the, uh, the non-discriminated group, uh, the grade is still higher, but the effort level is the same. So uh, with the same effort, uh, one of the groups, because of the, the innate tendency of the teacher to, to give a better, better grade to, to the blue ones, uh, um, is always higher, but, but then it goes to, to, to zero effort and, and the, the worst possible grade. Another example is shown here, which is a difference is, uh, is that, uh, uh, um, that we, uh, uh, we include an element for admir admiration of, for, for achievement, basically liking uh, those who are performing well, and that includes a kind of a, stabili a stabilization of, of effort and uh, grades at the highest level. But, but you can also observe that even in this situation, there is no... Um, uh, variation within the group with regard to the effort, and there is a very high high clustering of, of friendship networks, and at the same time, uh, it remains uh, stable that that uh, the effort level for the discriminated group is actually higher than the effort level that is uh, of the the majority group or the non-discriminated group. So, uh, what we actually observe this is a kind of a, a, a typical scenario that, that uh, we, don't, we are not unable to grow oppositional culture in the sense that is predicted by the literature. It, actually, we uh, observe the opposite, that, that uh, due to social influence uh, and due to, uh, uh, to the segregation of, 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 of a group context, uh, we, the, both groups actually converge to a, to a, to a stable uh, um, effort level. And if one of the groups is discriminated, it means actually that, that the, the, the discriminated group needs to perform uh, better in order to achieve the same achievement, and they do. So basically, they, they, they achieve the same grades with a higher effort uh, than the non-discriminated group. And this is the result that we have uh, with, with the various uh, parameter values, including uh, higher statistical discrimination by the teacher. Uh, or so because because we we also vary this uh, innate discrimination tendency, and also if we vary uh, the uh, the uh, uh, level of homophily that is present uh, with regard to to achievement and with regard to 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 uh, uh, group membership, of course they should be present to a certain extent. Um, and this is also the case uh, uh, if if all the achievement is observed and all. Uh, uh, or only, only, only the grade is, grade is observed, which is a more strict uh, condition for this to emerge. So, but uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, still what we, we observe is probably far away from uh, reality. And that's also in a sense that is also related to the previous question that, that what we observe is probably after a long, long time. Uh, and uh, what is time here in this kind of simulations that is not uh, uh, difficult to, to conceptualize. Um, and probably it's also interesting to see the short-term tendencies in the beginning of these agent-based simulations and not, not the end, end results that are over uh, 1,000 uh, ticks or something. Uh, so there is a, 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 a also the tendency that, that the, the dynamics that are uh, leading to these kind of results might be interesting. So. Um, the, just to, to conclude, uh, so basically that uh, uh, we don't have uh, 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 a tendency, we don't observe a tendency in which uh, there will be a, uh, a differences in, in, uh, in the average level of, of uh, between groups. So there is no oppositional culture that we can grow from this kind of assumptions. And there's also uh, actually even the opposite that, that uh, the, uh, the disadvantaged group uh, uh, members are uh, uh, doing higher effort, uh, but they also actually actually achieving the same kind of grades 
at the end. So uh, we are going to, to try this out also within the RCN framework. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, also we have plans to, to include different kind of uh, influences as was commented by Andreas uh, last time. Uh, so uh, that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karoy. Again, uh, a presentation that I believe uh, will trigger a lot of thoughts. So um, I wonder whether there are questions from the audience. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, maybe Federico, you had a question? I do have a question, Andreas. Um, uh, Karoy, I really like your presentation because I think that this gives us uh, another way to, um, you know, to use uh, agent-based modeling and 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 uh, network modeling and social network analysis in a complementary way. So we've seen so far also yesterday and today empirically calibrated network models. We've seen theoretical um, models of social networks, and this is yet another way. Uh, so what? What I was, uh, what I was um, wondering, I mean, in this case, you used uh, a, a, a theoretical, let's say, if I understood correctly, agent-based model to solve a puzzle stemming from a previous empirical work. Uh, in other works you have co-authored, like, for example, the one that Christoph um, showed us uh, before in his talk, uh, you did uh, start your simulations from empirical data. So the question is, uh, why did you uh, this time choose not to start from empirical data, not to calibrate your model from empirical data? Was it was it even possible? And 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 yeah, that's that's it. Thank you very much. I think these are the more more than one question, so all of them are quite quite interesting. But uh, let me start with the with with the the, uh, the empirical calibration issue. Is that that I think it's very important, and this is a kind of a much more complex process in uh, in reality. That that you have a, have a measurement of a phenomena uh, that is uh, uh, you already have some hypothesis in advance before you go to a field, and then you have uh, you are going to test a certain uh, hypothesis already in the empirical uh, empirical study and uh, and you are when when you are finished with this study uh, you realize that certain mechanisms are are there that are are very interesting and for instance in this case and that's that's uh, was uh, another part of your question what we observe in uh, in the hungarian case is that although we expected to to see this acting wide kind of phenomena and uh, in the hungarian school classes but we didn't observe this. So there is actually, it seems that there is no tendency to, to pull back those um, uh, who are by the Roma students who are very good performers. They are not excluded from the friendship circles. So that's, a, uh, um, that's, a, that's a, I, actually, I think that was a trigger probably to, 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 look, to, to test, uh, to go into the agent-based uh, uh, world, in this case, this way, uh, to, to um, to check the consistency of the theoretical approaches that, that claim that oppositional culture would be so relevant in this kind of circumstances. And uh, uh, when we see this kind of results in a, in a very simple, I would say this is a really simplistic agent-based model that, that is a, to a certain ex extent informed by the empirical situation because we opted for, for those kind of sizes, uh, those kind of param some parameter values are, in, are calibrated from, from there because I think, but concentrating at the same time only on those aspects of the, of the uh, uh, model and simplifying the rest of it, uh, that, 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 would be able, that would be crucial to determine if, if this kind of theoretical uh, assumptions are, are, are right or not. So then next step probably, and that's going to, uh, that's, that is planned to, to go back to the data and, and, and to try to, 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 to in, incorporate those kind of mechanisms that, that uh, we learned that are relevant from this agent-based simulation model. Uh, so this, this is, after all, I think it's a never, never ending uh, process that, 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 uh, that also uh, not clearly didactic uh, in a sense or, 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 or 
uh, not clearly uh, uh, in a deductive way. Uh, so there is uh, uh, absolutely, uh, and I think there is a lot of uh, uh, of this uh, philosophical uh, philosophical science discussion is going on about the agent the role of agent based models and uh, and uh, sociology. So there is uh, there is certainly relevant here to to uh, uh, get get more information back to the modeling approach and then and and also when you uh, for instance in the the previous How presentation. To Just one more sentence. Uh, that that, uh, that uh, is uh, could could also help us to 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 incorporate, for instance, negative ties and negative influence in this kind of models. Okay, that was an important sentence. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. Uh, you should hear a lot of virtual clapping now, uh, and uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, Jonas, are you ready? Yes, I, uh, I believe you can hear me, right? Perfect. So Jonas Stein is student at the University of Groningen, and he surely will tell you that this work comes from an earlier phase of his research. <laughs> that is correct. That uh, was and still is when I was uh, studying in Utrecht. Um, I'm doing this together with two other people, Mark Koisnik uh, from Linköping University in Sweden and with Arnold van der Wright uh, from the European University Institute. Oh, by the way, thanks for having me today. I have a quick warning. There's a lot of construction going on at the building today, so I hope we won't hear too much hammering, which is currently what they do. So this presentation will be on homophily in social networks and the propagation of false information. And uh, the starting point of our research was a couple of um, empirical papers with observational data who found that false information, fake news, disseminates more easily in homogenous social networks, so like clusters of like-minded individuals. And um, explanations for this phenomenon that they found were, well, they usually drew on social influence or social identity effects, yeah? So that like-minded individuals sitting together reinforce each other's pre-existing beliefs and that would then for, form these often so-called echo chambers. Um, one thing about these explanations is that from a theoretical standpoint, that would predict better dissemination of false and true information alike, as long as the information that circulates in this network matches the group beliefs. So why is it then the false information specifically? Mm, we thought about that for a while and um, now came up with another theoretical link um, that would concentrate more on this improved dissemination of false over the true information in homogenous networks specifically. What is perhaps nice about this theoretical link is that there is no assumption of social influence necessary, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I then um, use an agent-based model to illustrate this theoretical link and then lastly, we're also um, testing this link in an experimental setting. So that will then basically link the agent-based model with empirical data. All right, this theoretical link I've been talking about, we call a structural effect. Um, there are a few um, assumptions necessary so that this effect actually works. One is that there is some sort of confirmation bias going on in the individuals in a network. So yeah, the seeking or interpreting of evidence in ways that are partial to existing beliefs. Or in other words, that individuals will be more likely to accept some piece of information if it matches their beliefs. That's one assumption. And the other one is that we can treat information diffusion in a network, be it heterogeneous or be it homogeneous, um, as a percolation model. Um, for those who are not familiar with the term of a percolation model, it basically is based on this idea that uh, individuals in the network have a sharing probability or an infection probability. It's used in, um, in uh, yeah, the spread of disease, these kinds of research um, very widely, so therefore infection. Um, and that once the individual sharing probability of the people in that network passes a certain, certain threshold, that then the message will spread very widely, it will percolate. Um, if the individual sharing probability is too low, it will get stuck. It won't spread much at all. 
Um, so what then could happen in a homogenous network is that, yeah, the information is aligned with the ideology of the people in that network. Therefore, there is confirmation bias going on. Um, a percolation threshold is, is, is um, surpassed and most susceptible individuals um, are reached in little time, yeah? Whereas in a heterogeneous network where it's sort of random or just not as clustered, um, um, is that fewer individuals then are biased towards the information and the diffusion stops before all susceptible individuals are reached. Now, I still haven't talked much about true versus false information. Why would it be for false information specifically? And that's the last assumption that we need, need for the structural, um, structural effect, and that is credibility. Um, as long as we can um, assume that maybe false information is a bit less credible in general um, than true information, it would be the case that for false messages without the confirmation bias in a heterogeneous network, for example, um, the, the percolation threshold is not surpassed. However, when then the people are clustered together in a homogeneous network, the individual sharing probability rises, um, the, the percolation threshold is surpassed, and suddenly the information spreads very widely. Whereas um, if um, the message is a bit more credible, yeah, like take lots of people, any people, and there will be more of them who would be willing to believe in it, it's a little more credible, it's a true message, then the percolation threshold is already surpassed. So even when you then add the confirmation bias, not that much happens in, in terms of overall percentage of people in the network who shared that information. Right, that's the, that's the idea behind it. Now we use agent-based simulation to uh, illustrate this link. And uh, what we then did is we went into NetLogo and we constructed two types of networks, basically. First, the, uh, the homogenous, where, yeah, for any network, we took this ring letter structure that you can see here. Um, so like E, everyone has the same degree, everyone has the same centrality in the network. It's really nice because uh, through these like uh, parameters that are the same for each individual, you have less um, less chance, less noise, less probability that anything might might go wrong um, in the network. So that's the structure in general. And then homogeneous and heter heterogeneous, we we um, built by in the homogeneous network. One half of this ring, this lattice ring, is um, of one color only and of the others than the, the other. And in the heterogeneous network, it is simply random of who sits who. Um, in this case, I used blue and red nodes. Um, we can, for example, link that to uh, liberals and conservatives in the US, which I think works very well in our case, but we could also yeah, come up with another example, I think. Um, and then on sort of the, the micro level, um, we have um, uh, the message. Um, message has either a content. Um, the content we can again think of as maybe either liberal or conservative. Um, and the message is either true or it is false. And we have the agents. And the, all the agents have an opinion. Again, the opinion is also liberal or conservative. And they have a property that states whether the content that they may be exposed to is aligned with uh, their opinion. Yeah, so either the message is conservative and they are conservatives themselves, then it's aligned or it is not and be aligned. And um, the model then we can perhaps call it a susceptible infectious model. So basically, once um, an agent is exposed to the message, and the agent makes the decision to whether to share the message, which would be then to infect the neighbors, or to discard the message, which would then be to do nothing. Um, once you've made your decision, you're not susceptible anymore. Um, every time an actor is exposed to the message, um, they have to make a decision on whether to share it, which depends on their sharing probability. Uh, which is a function of a couple of parameters, a baseline sharing probability, um, then um, uh, of whether 
the message is aligned with their ideology or not, and whether the message is true or not. Um, the true, um, true or not, again, is then uh, reflected in this uh, plausibility idea. So if the message is true, then the sharing probability is generally a little bit higher than whether it would rather be false. And I think about the uh, bias and aligned, I've, I've explained that enough, maybe here, in the example, we have we have John. John is a, uh, is a, is a liberal, um, but the message that John gets exposed to is Republican. Um, so in that case, his sharing probability is a little bit lower because it's not aligned. And it is a fake message, meaning also the sharing probability is a bit lower. And um, we subtract 0 0.25 from the baseline sharing probability and end up with sharing probability for John specifically that is 25%. Uh, we then vary the parameters, base, bias, true bonus, we repeat that many times, and then me measure the spread of a message in those networks. Um, that is then the percent of all individuals in the network that shared the me message. And the echo chamber effect, we then call the difference in spread in a, a heterogeneous versus a homogeneous network. And the idea here um, that links to the structural, structural effect is that um, in, for false messages, we would observe an echo chamber effect, meaning they spread more widely in a homogeneous as opposed to a heterogeneous network, whereas for a true message, it actually does not matter that much. Results, um, well, um, can confirm our expectation here we can see that the higher the bias of the individuals in the network, um, the greater is the echo chamber effect. Whereas for true messages, the echo chamber effect actually is not that large. It more or less always stays around 0% slash gets negative actually um, at very high levels of bias. Um, Echo chamber effect, again, is nothing else but the percentage point difference in overall spread in a homogeneous network versus a heterogeneous network. Or, yeah, um, this is basically the same results visualized differently. You can see that um, in a homogeneous network, um, the percent of people in the network who shared it rises the higher the bias is. Um, it stays the same for the heterogeneous network for true messages, so that's the blue lines, it stays very close to each other the whole time, so um, not that much of an echo chamber effect for the true messages there. Um, now, as work in progress, the experimental test, unfortunately, I cannot tell you much about the results of that experimental test yet, but I might be able to sketch out a little bit how we're going to do it. Basically, we're testing our theoretical prediction, our prediction from the ABM in a laboratory environment with you know, participants. And we do that first by recruiting many conservative, many Republican and many liberal participants from a crowd working platform. In our case, this is Amazon Mechanical Turk, MTurk. Um, and then we, um, um, we link them to an artificial online social network, which we created where they get seats in this network. Um, and um, we, at some point, insert messages in these, uh, in, in these artificial online social networks, where they then may read and share or, or discard the message that they received. Um, the structure of these networks is um, equivalent to the agent-based model. So it's this ring that is structure. It's either homogeneous or heterogeneous, where in the heterogeneous network just then random um, where the blue and the, the, the red nodes are and homogeneous it's one half blue the other one is red then we insert messages which are 72 on total um, they are either true or false um, the true messages which we define as the ground truth um, are politically polarizing findings from social science journals from the last years whereas then flipping that around they're inverse we define as fake information or false information. Then the subjects can decide over sharing versus discard. Messages may start to spread in the network or die out. And then in the end, we measure the echo chamber effects for false and for true messages. 
then as the next step, we might also introduce incentives, which would then be the idea, are subjects sharing more true and less false information if they're rewarded for sharing true information and penalized for sharing false information. The idea behind those incentives would be then um, that we could actually observe if that was the case, that people can tell what is true and what is false as long as you incentivize them enough. If we don't observe that effect, then this might actually tell us that people um, simply don't know that better. They, they, just don't, they just don't know what is true and what is false, even if you give them money to only make the right decisions. Data connection is still pending. Sorry for that. Well, until now, we had this sort of um, yeah, very um, artificial social network. It's nice because it has an equal degree, et cetera. But the question is, would it work in a different network? Um, so I went into NetLogo again and made a couple more simulations with different type of networks. Uh, one is a scale-free network um, in which um, the degree of nodes, the distribution of the degrees of the nodes, follows a power law distribution. So you have very, very, very many, many nodes with very few degree, and then just a tiny fraction of nodes with a very, very large degree. Um, these scale-free networks are um, yeah, common to many um, real-world networks, which makes perhaps the simulation a bit less artificial. Um, and then we, we check whether we can, again, observe this echo chamber effect, and indeed it is there. Um, again, the greater the bias, um, the bigger the echo chamber effect. Um, another typical network is a um, small, net world network, uh, small world network uh, where we have a ring structure. Everyone is only connected to their very closest neighbors. But then we start introducing random ties that might go anywhere in the network. Um, and then see what happens to the echo chamber effects if we start to increase um, uh, the rewiring probability, the chance that a tie is random rather than to one of your closest neighbors. And what you can then see in this chart here is that the more you rewire, the less of an echo chamber effect is there. Um, you can rewire a little bit up to, for example, 5%, and you can still see um, how there's quite a difference between the blue dashed lines and the red dashed lines. Um, but when you have a relatively high rewiring probability, uh, let's say 15% here, there's not that much of a difference anymore. Why is that? Or is that, is that very um, dangerous to, to what we're trying to, to tell here? No, I don't think so. Um, because Essentially, the higher you make the random rewiring probability, the, the less of a difference there is between a homogeneous and a heterogeneous network. Yeah, because if you start introducing random ties in homogeneous networks, they become uh, less homogeneous. So once that's sufficiently high, of course, you won't be able to observe an echo chamber effect anymore because there is no difference between homo and hetero nets. All right, so in conclusion, um, this um, perhaps showed a little bit how network structure might contribute to the dissemination of false, especially over true messages, um, which was shown in the echo chamber effects that you can observe for false, but not so much for true messages. This effect increases in higher, higher bias. What is perhaps nice about this model is that there are only very few assumptions that are necessary for it, i.e. some degree of confirmation bias or just bias. I made that a little shorter uh, in the results section. And that the overall plausibility of true messages is higher than the overall plausibility of false messages. Uh, I think, yeah, that it is. That's it so far. And I think we have plenty of time for Q&A, right? Thank you very much, Jonas. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, plenty of time means, uh, to be precise, five minutes at most. <laughs> Let's go ahead. <laughs> and clap, clap, indeed. 
Can uh, I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anas, for the presentation. Uh, my question, I think, is more in the direction uh, for some kind of brainstorming here. Like, I've seen many studies, like including epidemics or uh, dissemination of uh, knowledge or influence or whatever, dynamical process on networks. And most of the studies, uh, it's based on like those uh, models of network structure, like a small word or preferential attachment one, that we know that they are unrealistic in terms of social structure. So my question is more like, a, what do we think about it? it, it are we missing a more, a more focus on trying to, um, to create network models, like a structure network models that are more realistic? Yeah, um, the thing about, well, it's, it's, I guess it's a bit of a question of where you want to go. Do you want to build a network that is as realistic as possible, which would then be, um, uh, yeah, sacrificing, um, yeah, the, the purity of the experimental setting where everyone has the same degree, where less can go wrong, where there's less confounding influence. Um, or do we want to make it as realistic as possible or probably only just stick with, with real world observational data? And I think for the real world observational data, we have a few papers already. So, um, but yeah, I suppose um, that that is still a challenge for, for model building, uh, for agent-based model building to really, um, yeah, um, build graphs that are a very close reflection of reality. Thank you. Uh, could I ask a question? Of course, Wanda, but you, it's hard to hear you, at least for me. Better, probably. That's better. Okay. Please uh, um, I was wondering why you uh, use the concept of true and false uh, information. And why not uh, uh, talk in terms of information that is consonant or dissonant with your own position? Uh, because that also opens up possibilities of including heterogeneity in agents concerning their acceptance for deviant messages. And I think that might be very interesting when you want to explore opinion dynamics. Right, so why false and true information? Because uh, I would see it as a pressing social problem. Um, and um, why not also, um, I think you, you, you well, um, uh, I think we have what you were asking for in this idea of is a message aligned or not, right? Um, because that, yeah, um, reflects whether an individual would like it uh, or, or would be ideologically aligned with it or not. Um, or do you mean a different but dimension does, here? Does that mean that what is true for one agent can be false for another agent? Mm, they might one agent might believe something to be true and another might believe it to be false. Um, but in the end, at least in this experimental test and in the ABM as well, a message is either true or false for the whole network. That's the ground truth versus something that is fake. Can I ask a quick question about this? Okay. Yes, please. please. Very quick, please. Yeah. Uh, so, Jonas, the from the perspective of the of the agents in your model and of the humans in your experiment, am I correct that the only difference between true and false is their level of credibility? 
that you set in the experiment and that you assume that human participants give to the information. So from, the, from their perspective, there is no objective difference between true and false information except for their credibility. That is right. Yes. Yes. Quick answer, yes. <laughs> I'm very happy with this quick answer. Thank you very much, <laughs> everyone. Th thanks a lot. Uh, okay. Uh, there was one question in the chat. Sorry, we didn't have time for that, but perhaps Jonas, you can uh, later turn to it and give an answer uh, uh, to uh, uh, Michael Frischkopf, who asked that question. So let's move on uh, uh, to the next presentation uh, then, uh, which will be given by Alec McGill from Cornell University. Uh, Alec, are you ready? Yes. Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, uh, Alec, I believe you are a PhD student, right, at Cornell University? That's right. Uh, okay. It's my uh, fourth year now. Yeah. So uh, you will further introduce yourself. We are looking forward to, to your presentation. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen. Let's try maybe this. Okay, here we go. Is that good? Looks good to me. Yes. Okay, yeah, so this is, um, this is a project I actually started uh, my first year uh, as a PhD student, and it's a basic thought experiment. So I'm incredibly sort of humbled to be in the presence of such other presenters that are presenting just massive projects with tons of empirical data. This is really just a thought experiment exploring a specific uh, network mechanism, which I hadn't seen which I felt operated in my daily life. So this is about extroversion. Um, okay, uh, very simple definition. I'm not gonna start with uh, theoretical. This, this was very much just a intuition driven project. So I'm gonna keep it that way in presentation. So define extroversion as a preference for the number of hours per week a person desires to spend with others. Um, I recognize that there are other reasonable definitions of this, uh, many others, uh, but this is what I'm running with for this presentation. So each person, you know, has a specific quantity, and if they're under that quantity, I guess that's on this next slide, um, they will be impelled to find new friends. And if they have too much social interaction, this is the other side of it, if they're over-socialized, so-called, um, have more than their desired amount, then they will try to remedy that in, in another way by, um, and the only real choice they have in my simulation is to cut ties. So they can find, they can find new friends and they can cut ties. Already a little bit unrealistic, but I hope the, the results are interesting enough. Um, so what does this look like? We've got three individuals in this basic example with extroversion five, two, and one. Okay, so they're all gonna really want to find friends right now. So it's basically in the model a random choice as to which one finds it first. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about timing in a second. This is continuous time. So let's, let's say five and one decide they're gonna become friends. Um, in the model, the way this works is that one of these, uh, either five or one, sort of was impelled first to act and then went out into the network and chose somebody else who also is looking for a friend. So the idea is that um, others that are also under socialized would make themselves available to friendship, whereas those that are over socialized would be characteristically unavailable. And they establish an enduring tie, which is a compromise between what they both want. So the person that wants to spend say one hour a week, um, you know, and the person that spends wants to spend five hours a week, they, neither of them, they can't be totally satisfied by this new contractual obligation, whatever you want to call it, this new recurring event, this new relationship. So they choose something uh, uniformly at random between what they both desire. Okay, and the model proceeds. Um, next, we have two that acts. Um, it, it, in principle, could have been any of these, but uh, two would uh, have quite quite a bit of motivation to create a new friendship. 
and five still wants um, an hour and a half um, in addition to the three and a half you're spending with one and thus compromises with two, somewhere between one and a half and two. So let's say 1.75, but like I said, it's uniformly at random. Um, and this process sort of continues. So maybe one breaks this attachment because it's just spending too much time with five over what their preference is. Um, then associates with two, who still wants just 0.25 hours. Um, so it's something between 0.25 and one, et cetera. So hopefully that's clear how this um, progresses. So I guess I'll, I'll talk a bit about time. So the way this is simulated is using, it, it's uh, simulated as a continuous time mar Markov process, um, but the uh, Markov propensities are up, updated in discrete time. So at the beginning, um, each person will sort of, will, will determine a stress, uh, which is, the mean of an exponential distribution, it ends up. So I can show that here. The, the way this model works in this upper left plot, you can see that uh, there's a direct mapping from the percent uh, of socialization of, of um, hours per week needed over what they, they would like. So if they, if they want 25% um, more, then there's a certain mapping between that and the mean time to act. So this is specifying the parameter of an exponential distribution, describing how much time. Um, I believe I used uh, 0 0.2. <laughs> I don't know how useful it is um, for this specific simulation. Uh, and on the right, I just showed um, a, a sampling from an exponential distribution with parameter five. That'd be right here, you know, 40%, they need 40% more or 40% less than their, uh, their empirical times to action will follow this distribution. So they, they sort of have, um, uh, let's see if this works. So he, he, here I, I'm showing, uh, I think, fit maybe 25 individuals um, with varying extroversions. So the size of the circle here, the size of their dot represents their extroversion. And let's see if I can get this. Yep. So this is act actually how the simulation progressed in one um, realization. As they're sort of creating ties, breaking ties, um, and this is only over maybe the very beginning of this network formation process. I started from just nothing. I assume this is a group of people that were just placed in a room, like you were talking about, um, Jonas, uh, like having some idealized control experiment. Well, my control experiment is I just have a group of people and they're in a room and they have to be there for a while. <laughs> and they start making friendships over the course of maybe months. Um, so, okay, let's zoom out a little bit. This is the same realization, except we're looking at a larger time span. We can sort of see a continuing temperature as everybody's trying to figure out how to stabilize. And if we zoom out even further, we do see some slowing down of network formation, network um, detachment, and, and there are some ties which persist over a long period of time. So you can see at the top here, there's a friendship that's formed around halfway through the simulation and stays there throughout the rest of the simulation while others are sort of continuously re, um, so this node seems to be having trouble finding uh, an adequate arrangement. I think the, the time scale that makes sense for this, uh, just intuitively speaking, is maybe weeks. So we're looking over the course of two years now of a network formation process. Okay. And this is what it looks like if we scale up uh, the number of nodes, which is what I do in, in the simulations. It, it doesn't really look that informative, so I guess I'll, I'll move on. Oh, I have it in the corner, 300 nodes here, okay. So here's uh, five realizations of the previous network I just showed you. Um, and what I'm plot plotting here is the percent of people that are, quote, lonely, where we can define lonely as having less than 50% of their desired social time actually realized by their current social um, ties. And there's a few things to notice here. One is that um, for all the simulations, this does stabilize. Um, it seems to sort of 
you know, there's, there's this rapid um, initial stabilization period and then it, it sort of bottoms out and we see it going up and down and up and down this um, percent of people that are lonely in the population. And the second thing I think to realize here is that it's not going to zero. It's not optimizing. So this situation I initially found interesting because an individual's decision, you know, based on their own extroversion actually changes the market for time in the whole social network so that it's not so straightforward that there should be an equilibrium at zero, that everybody should eventually be satisfied, that they should find it through this individualistic process of altering their ties. And we can do the same thing with over-socialization. So here's a plot of over-socialization over time. It starts at zero when everybody's lonely. And um, again, has this sort of equilibrium, um, you know, it's different for different realizations, but hovers between 10 and 20% of the population have more than 100, like one and a half times what they would actually desire in terms of the, the amount of time that they spend with others. So another interesting phenomenon in these, it, it's a thought experiment. This is not a re real, um, social situation by any means, but it's a thought experiment about how this mechanism might play out, that uh, the percent of people that are over-socialized is actually greater than the percent, percent of people that are under-socialized. So we can look at, the, uh, this is just a nice plot that I um, sort of created out of the simulation, which shows um, every individual, so the, there are 300 individuals here um, stacked, uh, and on the x-axis we have time. And what is plotted here is their uh, mean time until an action. So this is the mean time until they will end a friendship, some friendship. It, it, in my model, the action is dis disentangled from like what, is, what actually happens. So they're impelled to end a friendship and then they choose um, who to remove. So we can see, uh, in some sense, individuals over socialization over time. And on the bottom, so the, the lower, um, that means the, the more urgent it is <laughs> that they end some friendship. And on the bottom, we, we see the average time until making a friend. So this is sort of a graph of loneliness through the population. Um, and some things to, to note is just that there's sort of a uniform distribution of urgency across the population, that everybody experiences loneliness and over-socialization in my simulation. And these individuals are actually ordered from top to bottom by extroversion. So the, the, the note, I, I expected to see some dramatic patterns <laughs> um, when, I did, when I ordered in this way, that there would be a difference um, depending on extroversion on how uh, lonely you felt <laughs> on a typical um, or how over socialized and just qualitatively speaking, I don't see extreme differences, although I do see a lot of urgency uh, sort of at the very uh, bottom in terms of end friendship. There's, there's nothing um, very clearly different. So it's, it really is the amount of over, -socializ over socialization or under socialization, or the propensity over the course of years of this um, is really a social phenomena and not uh, an individual phenomena, which is built from uh, the distribution of extroversion in that population. Okay, and I, this is a just a start of something. So I, I have a lot of ideas of what to do next in this simulation. I'm a big fan of like inserting a lot of complexity into a simulation and seeing if that uh, messes things up. Like you're talking about like uh, having your um, simulation, you know, if it's not idealistic, then there's other things that sort of mess it up. Well, I, I, I want to know what those things are, like how they would mess it up. So I'd like to just have a, a garden of different other social phenomena, other di different mechanisms of friendship attachment that I can throw in alongside this extroversion and see what, what happens to these um, qualitative sort of macro observations. So different definitions of extroversions, for instance, I think a lot of times extroversion is defined not as, 
amount of time, or, you know, maybe we need another word of that word for that, but like the variety of friends that you would associate with the, the number of them, and maybe it would be for um, in total a greater amount of time, but the, the real feature is that you like a diversity. Okay, so different and, and generally different um, preferences of um, personal uh, social networks. Um, different distributions of extroversion. So in this, I was using um, extroversion from 0.1 to, to 1, and I would, uh, you know, just equally space the, the extroversions of the population, depending on how many people I had. Um, but what happens if we have two groups? One, one group is extremely extroverted and one group is extremely introverted. That's just an example. Of course, homophily, um, and, and any other sort of social network uh, mechanism, I'd like to sort of just throw it in. Um, these social fo foci, I'm sorry, I'm receiving a call. It's very distracting. Um, I'm also interested, in, okay, at the bottom here, what if we add 100 people, what if we remove? 100 people. So these are shocks to the network. So what if we let the network stabilize and then, you know, 100 new people move into this room? How, how does that reconfigure? How quickly are they assimilated? And, and, you know, you would imagine that once the market is sort of saturated, that they would have a hard time finding friends, for instance. Is that true? Um, and what if, you know, 100 people move away? How quickly do, does the population sort of restabilize? Um, and more generally speaking, I've, I've been building this uh, as a general Python package where you can specify the uh, function, which determines based on the context of an individual, the, the, this time to action. So you as, a, as an analyst specify this function and you specify an act function, which is what, what happens when they act, do they connect to people? Do they drop connections? Do they connect to foci? Um, do they change some sort of internal um, attribute? And I, I would like to make this a more general application for um, investigating these sorts of thought experiments, but this is future work. Um, and I'm sure I have lots of time. This was um, originally a 10 minute presentation. So um, I guess that leaves a lot of time for questions. Leave it to you, but that's all I have. Hey, uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Alec. Uh, so I hope uh, people have uh, questions. Uh, you gave us a lot uh, uh, to think about. Um, uh, well, we do have about five minutes because the next plenary presentation starts at uh, two, uh, uh, 4 p.m., sorry. Um, uh, so we sh should make sure people can uh, go there. So please, uh, anyone uh, with a, uh, who has a question, I'm looking forward to hear them. I see something in the chat. Um, uh, so uh, um, I just read the question to you, uh, Alec. Okay, thanks. It's from Ali Akbar Akbaritabar. I hope I read that correctly. Um, I'm wondering if your agents have memory of their previous actions. I mean, what differs between different ticks? It feels as if every new round is a reset or am I not getting something? You're correct. So these are totally memoryless agents um, where, and, and it's sort of a formal property of the system that they only, their propensity to act and their decisions to act, like what they actually decide to do, only depends on their current state. That being said, um, there's nothing that precludes me from including in their current state something about, you know, including a memory and having them having a higher propensity to reattach to the, I, I guess that's probably the memory you're thinking of. They would reattach or avoid reattachment maybe to those that they had already um, interacted with and broken an attachment from. But yes, it's, it's to totally memoryless, only dependent on the current state. And in this case, the, the only current state is the state of the network at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. 
uh, well, I hope the, uh, guy, uh, the one who asked the question is happy with your answer. Um, and I see there's another question uh, also from uh, Robert Krause, which is, uh, uh, first of all, he says, hi, Alec, amazing model. Regarding the distribution of extra version, I think you can rely on data which shows it to be normal distribution as with most other human traits. Looking forward to your future research. So this is more a suggestion than a question, but maybe you want to react uh, to it. Mm -hmm. Well taken. I mean, there was no, I, it was sort of, like I said, it was a thought experiment. So this sort of linear distribution of extroversion, I didn't necessarily think would be realistic. Um, normal definitely makes more sense and getting some bounds around what, how this extroversion um, actually plays into people's actions on a psychological level. I think getting more real world data about that um, could be really useful in refining this as a thought experiment. But thank you. Okay, I see uh, more questions. Uh, there's one uh, from uh, Philip Achnesens, uh, and I think you just unmuted. So Philip, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had actually two questions. One was, um, so in your model, are strong ties, so because you have the strength of the tie, right? Are strong ties actually more stable than weak ties as a consequence of what you're doing? And would that be something you could consider and related with that? So if I understand it right, so once you, you build a tie, you can either remove the tie or keep the tie. You cannot mm -hmm. reduce the tie. So That's it's right. not that that can be going from five or 3.2 to going to one. So, and what is the impact of that? Because it's, it's a very extreme situation where you say you're friends and now suddenly you're not friends anymore. You can have type five, suddenly it disappears. Type two, it disappears. That seems a very different social mechanism. It's like the weak and strong tie argument. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I did have a previous model that was more complex and found um, it was with smaller networks and they would have all kinds of added um, sort of uh, cognitions about how they would form and break ties. So they would modify ties. They would, mm -hmm. and it, it was always this discrete action. So it's the idea is that you, there's a new thing that you do every week or there's a new like way that you've, you know, figured out how they interact or, um, or you've cut something from what what was a recurring um, social tie, and it you know qualitatively I found similar results, but computationally it started bogging me down. Um, also, my code was just a mess, so I really wanted to reduce the complexity so I could, like I, I just refactored all this stuff um, over the summer, and I just wanted to make sure that I was actually doing what I thought I was doing. So that's. Uh, a short, I think it's a, gr a great idea, though, um, to sort of uh, build, build in that stronger ties matter more. And actually, you don't always have choice about who you make or break ties with. Uh, so family is a good sort of instance where you are sort of forced to have some sort of social interaction. So maybe that's depleting whatever this well of extroversion we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you can't break those, maybe. Um, I hope that that helps. I, I do think that's really reasonable. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I believe in the interest of time, uh, we should uh, um, wrap up now. Um, first of all, let me thank again uh, all the speakers uh, for their great presentations and their discipline on time, uh, which makes me happy as chair, of course. Uh, um, also, thanks for the uh, lively discussions, the questions of everyone. Uh, just uh, um, not to forget, uh, tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. there is a, the third uh, session of this uh, series of sessions on linking networks and edge-based modeling. And we will have uh, one uh, invited speaker there per block talking about modeling COVID-19, spread and the role of networks in it. And we have three further in, uh, uh, submitted presentations there. So we would uh, look a lot forward to, uh, to see you back tomorrow. Hopefully we will. Um, okay, and by this I say goodbye and wish you a very great uh, rest of uh, today. Everybody, goodbye.